Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the industry and share with you what we have learned from them and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Before we get started, I want to ask you something. Are you looking for a community of professionals that are looking to share, learn, and grow where you can talk openly and freely about the highs and lows in your business? If so, I want to invite you to check out my inner circle at AngelaProfit.com slash membership. Hi, y'all. It's Angela Prophet, and thank you so much for joining me today on another episode of Weddings Unveiled. And today, I'm super excited to talk with Michelle Swartz. She is the CEO and publisher of the Modern Jewish Life Media Company. Thank you so much, Michelle, for taking the time out to join us today. I'm so honored to be here. You're, you are one of the like wedding media stars. So <laughs> I feel like I'm like made it now that I'm here on your podcast. So thank Aww, you so much. You're so sweet. I love to educate and, and help people because I feel like when I started so long ago, it's like these resources were not available. And so, so many people come back and they say, oh my gosh, this helped me so much. And this helped me deal with this. And this helped me with that. And it's the same gratification that you get helping other business owners mm -hmm. as walking a couple like into their party. So it's so happy. Like it makes me happy to hear, you know, that we can help other people out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I cannot wait to hear about your background and like how you specifically help people and educate people on Jewish weddings and how to get into those and some other things. So what's your background and how did you get into that niche? So thank you so much for asking because I, I do think it is a pretty cool niche that I, I found myself in. Yeah. So I am really started at Walt Disney World, which is oh. um, not Jewish <laughs> in that I worked seven days a week and uh, just anyway, I, I worked in hospitality at Disney and that was before Disney had Disney weddings and it really even knew what they had in terms of ability for to host conferences and special events. There was no meetings group. It's not at all like what you see today. And so I happened to be working at the front desk, just trying to work my way up in the company at the hotel that had the first convention center, which was the contemporary. So then um, as part of the front desk duties, the front desk is kind of the heartbeat of any hotel. You ever want to get into hospitality, it's the best starting place ever. Right. <laughs> um, so we kind of became ex facto the meetings part of the convention center because again back then there weren't like ups stores or fedex stores where you could go and ship things so or where you could get faxes yes faxes so the front desk became the heartbeat of the convention center um, and so through that i learned a lot about meetings and events and then i went over to the grand floridian beach resort which now is where Disney Weddings is located. But again, there wasn't such a thing. And the very first wedding at Disney World took place in the lobby of the Grand Floridian. And again, the front desk became the ex facto wedding. Weddings, you know, we took care of blocking off the traffic for the bride photos and all those little things that <laughs> that's awesome. The interns get to see when they come work for you and me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I fell in love, I fell in love with events and I knew that was kind of what I wanted to do. And after several years at Disney, I was homesick really. And it was time for me to come back to Texas. And instead, because like every Jewish mother, mine wanted me to meet a nice Jewish boy. 
<laughs> I went to Dallas because they had a really big young Jewish population. And I found myself working at a Jewish congregation in their in-house event planning, meaning I was the liaison between the rabbis and all the families whenever they needed to schedule their bar and bat mitzvah, their weddings, their baby namings, and even their shiva minions for, for the end of life. And I learned everything there was to learn about Jewish life cycles by working there. Um, I taught religious schools. I learned even more. And we had, we had three event spaces that I was managing. So we had our own kitchen staff. I mean, it was just a really, it was, I probably wasn't qualified enough to be in the job when I started, but by the end, I felt like I could, you know, run the world. Yeah. <laughs> so then, you know, a wedding blog became kind of the perfect and, and the niche of Jewish wedding planning and became just kind of the perfect blend of all of my skills and my journalism degree from way back, way back yeah. in the day. So. I love what I, what I've spent my life kind of doing and I'm proud of my Jewish heritage. And I think the life cycle events are beautiful. And yeah. now as a business owner, or just like you, I get, I get the twin joys of helping people training others about how to market to the Jewish community. And then the challenges that we all have as, as business owners and what can we do about those? Do you remember, so when you started out, did the Modern Jewish Wedding, do you remember like the very first blog or article or editorial piece from a media perspective that you like put out there and what you talked about? I do. What and was it's it? It's embarrassing. I mean, it's just because, so when starting a blog, you can stare at that empty, you know, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get page so to speak forever or you can just finally start publishing and building your audience and it was like I have to just start right I have to have something to share on my social channels so people will go so I have this huge girl crush on Amy Atlas and her dessert bars yes yum. And my birthday is on Halloween Ooh. and my wedding that I had always dreamed of at this point I I I was, I was sort of just starting to plan my wedding. I think when I got started, I'm not sure, but I knew my wedding was going to be around Thanksgiving. And so my favorite dessert bar of Amy Atlas's ever I duplicated for my wedding was her Thanksgiving dessert bar. And I started by talking about dessert bars as a trend for weddings and how oh. a Jewish couple could incorporate this fabulous idea into it, which shows you how long ago it is because I don't really see many of those anymore. We still in the South where I feel like we're a little behind sometimes and people still do like the sweets and the, and the I big think, bars. Yeah, I think we do them still, but they're really different now. Yeah. Like there'll be colors of macaroons or mm -hmm. more finger foods. I mean, this was just like, she does the elaborate displays which I still love. And I still, I still do talk to her. Yeah. Um, and so she's still going strong, but <laughs> so that's awesome. That how I started. Yeah. That was my first post. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so as your as everything has evolved, like as a business owner and a blogger, like what would you say the top three things for people who are listening, who, if they're inspired to do something to educate in a niche or to start a blog, like what would you say to think about and test out before you actually get going? Oh, wow. Or would that's, you just jump in? That's really a great question. Said. So I think, <laughs> I think we're seeing a real change in the way wedding bloggers are going to be able to monetize. Mm -hmm. So I think if, before you do just jump in, you have to really decide why you're starting this blog. Are you starting to reach couples um, or are you starting and then maybe a membership base is a better monetization? Like for a year, you get all this unlimited content while you're planning your wedding. Um, or are you looking to enhance your planning business? So you want to draw people to your website and showcase what you do or 
are you looking to be as I was? I wanted to be the style me pretty for the Jewish bride. Um, in which case my audience was not so much, I mean, was wedding couples for sure, but was also wedding vendors to get them to advertise or to do sponsored content. And most importantly, to submit content, because if you don't have content to curate, then you definitely won't have readers. So I think the first thing is deciding why you're starting. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, you got to just dig in, um, make sure that you know your keywords and make sure that you're posting at least three, if not five times a week. I always say start slower because it's easier to build up than to back off. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you then, and you want, as you develop readers, for them to know when to expect. Like, are you going to publish Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, Monday and Friday? Like, what can they expect? And then to have some themes. Um, because now, I mean, when I first started, Instagram didn't exist and Pinterest mm -hmm. didn't exist. So now you have to think of your blog in terms of that content and how you're going to spread it. So the, it's got to be visual. It can't just be me screaming at the top of the mountain, like, this is how your Jewish wedding should be. I have to have pictures that show that. So um, you have to think about what you're putting out there in terms of where else you want it to be seen, um, whether that be Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, or you know, a Tumblr, or are you going to do Snapchat filters, all of those things you should probably know in advance. And then again, get out there and do it because you'll learn from those mistakes and you'll learn from what are the best ways to get traffic, which posts do that the most. Um, and that will help you develop a, a rhythm and a momentum to it. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things, and I would love to get your thoughts on this, is like, it, and it sounds like it's very similar with you. It's like you've got couples and that look at the content and learn from it. And then you also have the vendor side um, where they can advertise. And I'm not sure if you feature them, but do you, what is your thoughts on like having a balance on having information to where it serves the couples as well as the vendors? Do you try to go back and forth or as far as the content goes, or do you try to only limit yourself to the content that's going to help both, both audiences? I think that's a really hard struggle um, yeah. <laughs> that, that we all go through. So I will say that my choice has been that on my homepage, the blog is strictly for the couples. Gotcha. Come get inspiration. It's all that content is free to get. We have free downloads if you want to sign up for the for the email list and um, all of that is free. And then for the vendors, there's kind of like this separate little portal that has, well, I should say, you know, couples go there too. That's all about really explaining the traditions and how to facilitate a Jewish wedding. If, if you're a planner or a photographer, like what can you take pictures of? that kind of thing and how to submit content. Um, and if you do want to do a sponsored post or advertise what we do about that, I think, and this is kind of one of those do as I say, not as I do areas mm -hmm. that really for vendors now, you're better off rather than trying to advertise in a directory. Forgive me, Abby, for saying this out loud. <laughs> I know you're going to kill me if you ever hear it. You're better off asking for a sponsored Instagram post yeah, or an Instagram takeover where, you know, it doesn't look quote unquote like sponsored content mm -hmm. um, or a Pinterest board, a dedicated Pinterest board. Like, I mean, Pinterest is still my number one driver of traffic. So a vendor who wants to reach the Jewish audience anywhere in the world is much better having like if I had a photographer who wanted a dedicated Pinterest board of all their Jewish wedding stuff to me that's probably going to go a lot further for that vendor than um than buying a directory listing on my site and of course the best way for vendors and it's totally free is to submit content mm -hmm. I mean 
and I think that's the one thing where all vendors and and when I'm a planner I'm in the same place like we have so much going on and to get the photographer to get us the images and to send them out to all the other vendors and to make sure we have the hyperlinks and all of that um but that's free PR yeah. and my homepage gets a ton of traffic. So if you're not sending stuff in, but you're paying to be in a directory listing, like probably your ROI for your sweat equity is better <laughs> to take the time to submit that content. That gives me an idea. Like we just did a Jewish wedding not too long ago. I'm like, we need to submit Christina's wedding. Like it was gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's like those of us that are in the trenches, it's like we're so busy sometimes that absolutely we don't think about as planners and designers, like we don't usually it's our client and the client's like, Hey, can you submit my pictures to this? And they're like super specific. And I'm like, Well, do you have a relationship there? Or you know, and and it's a collaborative effort. Like this is something that is just um, really fresh on my brain. It's like we recently had a wedding that they, they, the couple, they were on the cover of this magazine and they had a six page spread and uh, they, yeah. it was, it was great. And we love working with the photographer and all the vendors. I didn't even know it was happening. And so when it came out, people were texting and they're like, oh my gosh, they're on the front. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing. I, I didn't even know. And so then I, I contacted the photographer and I'm like, obviously you guys knew this was happening. Like, and th the lead guy is like, well, we did submit some pictures, but we didn't know we were chosen. And I'm like, well, how did they get all the information? And so then I, after doing some research, they sent the bride this questionnaire. And what's funny is when you hire a planner, uh, like a full service planner, the planner knows more than the bride generally. Absolutely. Of <laughs> who the right vendors were and who did what and all that. And so several big things in the magazine were completely wrong. Two of the companies, totally wrong name. And then it had like coordinator oh. in the and I'm like, oh no, we don't do coordination. We have we haven't done coordination in like over ten years. Like this is bad. Yeah. So I contacted the magazine, the owner, and he emailed me back, and he's like, well, we get all this information from the bride. And I'm like, I did more digging. I'm like, no, actually, you have a form the bride fills out, and they don't know any different. And but my clients actually know the difference between a planner, a designer, a coordinator, a director, a consultant because their pocketbook knows the difference. Right. So exactly. I'm like, there's opportunity for improvement for education. And it, as you being one of the top only print magazine left in Tennessee, like when you want to get this right and like educate people. And so there's just so much opportunity to educate people because then it's giving the couples the wrong information. Right. So what I didn't understand is why wouldn't they send it to the planner? So, well, my question for you is who is typically submitting to you? Is it the Brad? Is it the photographer? Is it the planner? Like, where do you see all, all of these opportunities coming from? So, I'm so glad you asked me because <laughs> I, we know each other through kind of the wedding conference circuit and, yeah. and we pride on ourselves on getting education and also, you know, helping educate others. And that was actually something that a planner said to me at Engage. It wasn't, you know, it was like in an informal uh, a dining, you know, we were uh -huh. sitting next to each other. And so as so often happens, it's what happens, be quote unquote, behind the scenes and the informal networking opportunities that we can always exchange information and really learn from one another. Yeah. And she said to me, she's like, I would so much rather, you know, be the one to give the information. If you, when you get a submission from a bride, if you could contact me, that would be helpful. And, and it turned out that not only was getting the information from the, I call it the planner, but the, the, the designer or yeah. the person who, who really sources out all the really wonderful things that we're showcasing. The, um, 
it, they could write a really compelling paragraph that actually our brides uh, or couples, I should say, because we do also have, have, um, same sex marriages, yeah. modern Jewish weddings. So the couples really, that was more what they wanted to read about. They wanted to read about how this beautiful thing comes together because that's what they're looking for. They're mm-hmm. looking to find out what they need to do to bring that into their own mind's eye. And so I learned that from, from, an, you know, someone, another person in our hemisphere, in our circle who markets to those luxury couples who wanted to, who wanted to have a seat at the table and was like, no, I need to be the one filling out this form, not the couple. Um, So that was one thing. And then another thing is that we really almost exclusively take content. If it's not from um, the planner, we really don't anymore take bride and bride, bride or groom submitted. We tell them they need to submit through their photographer because really and truly the photographer owns the images. Correct. And so we almost exclusively take content from submitted through to bright lights because that ensures us that the photographer owns the images and has the right to publish them in whatever, um, and has already contacted or knows the other vendors and that that is information that's submitted, um, along with the, the photos. So we almost, I mean, almost, I would say 98.5% of our content comes through from two bright lights. Yeah, I I really love that platform. It just from when when we have clients that want us to submit things, we it just makes things easier. It um is the it's best. yeah, it's whoever developed it, <laughs> yay. <laughs> like it's awesome. Yeah. Um and and I, I wonder too, like your experience with um, you know, same sex in the Jewish community. Like we've had really positive experiences, um, ever since like it was legalized and, but I won't say that like every vendor is on board and we did a Jewish wedding, um, with two gentlemen, one of them, he is the lead anesthesiologist at Vanderbilt, um, you know, which is an amazing research hospital in Nashville. And then his partner is the lead judge for, a bunch of large cases in Nashville and they right when it all became legalized there was a lot of controversy around this in various faiths but I feel like in the Jewish community they were very accepting and at least in my experience so far and it was just awesome because their video was featured on some commercial about educating people on same-sex marriage that just because they're getting married to the same sex doesn't make them like a lesser of a person. And like here we had like this guy who was super smart, literally saving lives, also was in the military, was an anesthesiologist for the military, and like these two prominent leaders in the community And I, it like gives me chills when I talk about them because they're so awesome and they showed it in such a positive light. I'm, I want to send you their stuff too. Because Oh my gosh. I would love it. I would love it. So it was just, I don't get in the same sex stuff. So the more, I mean, those are almost always a hundred percent published because we just don't have enough of them. And again, you know, things that I've learned from my peers at conferences, you really, you want to have, and it's always been my goal at Modern Jewish Wedding, that that website is a very big tent. And so to kind of answer your question, um, you and I are both in the South. So Uh it's, it is a little different even for the Jewish communities here than it is in St. New York and California Jewish communities, which of course are the large populous Jewish communities. Mm-hmm. My biggest readers are actually New York, California, Florida, and not where I live, which is in Texas. Mm-hmm. So um, I will say that even before it was realized, um, I participated in the very first 
I guess we called it at that point, a commitment ceremony. And it was a spiritual ceremony Mm -hmm. that was held in Dallas, Texas. And when I was working at that temple, that was something that we did. And we were all really clueless. We just really didn't know what to do. We didn't know how to ask the right questions of who's escorting you down the aisle. Are are we calling one of you quote the groom and one of you quote the bride? Um, It was just a big learning experience for all of us. But the chills that we got seeing those two men stand in front of a rabbi and get to express their love for one another, I will never forget that to this day. It was just Mm -hmm. truly beautiful. And now that it's legal, and now that we do have experts and we have blogs and we have wedding magazines dedicated to same-sex ceremonies, we now have the language to talk about it. And one thing that I'm always really careful about is I try really hard to use gender neutral language. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's really hard, you know, because truly um, 80% of my readers are actually non-Jewish women who are marrying into a Jewish family. So I do often talk about the quote bride, but I do try and talk about the wedding couple or the, the brides or grooms or so that we, so again, that I have this big tent. Now I do that. Also knowing that that could really, really offend some of my Orthodox readers, my Orthodox Mm -hmm. Jewish readers, because same-sex marriage is still not recognized in the Orthodox community. And I do also publish Orthodox weddings um, because I want to reach those readers as well. So, you know, you can search on the blog, you can search under categories, you can search under orthodox, you can search under same sex. So if there's something that you're looking for to inspire you while you're planning your wedding, or if you're a planner who wants inspiration for a couple that you're working with, you can do that. You can search on those things. Um, And that seems to have worked and that I do have readers of, of all orthodox, conservative, and reform uh, um, religious beliefs who, who do come to the blog, it, but it is a lot more on the more liberal side of Judaism. And that's liberal with a, a lowercase L, <laughs> um, <laughs> liberal side of Judaism and that they recognize same sex and interfaith marriage. And really for, at least in the Jewish community, it's much more who's going to accept an interfaith marriage than who's going to accept a same-sex marriage. It's almost harder for um, interfaith marriage yeah. than for same-sex. Um, but also, just in terms of vendors, I think part of that is the whole you get what you put out kind of thing. So mm-hmm. since I do publish same-sex weddings, I have vendors who are very... Um, open to providing services for those who want to be a part of my community and, um, and who I, you know, who I feel more comfortable around because that's something I feel strongly about. So even being in the South, I, I guess I tend to surround myself around people who believe as I do, which again is let's have a big tent and there's a seat for everyone at the table. And we don't all necessarily have to agree, but we can certainly all respect one another. And I don't see why, you know, we have to have nastiness right in, at least in the blogosphere, like around, around a happy occasion. It just, I don't like it. So, yeah, I'll just, I'll never forget. Like one of the first, um, same sex weddings we did was, it was not legal in, in Tennessee. And, we did two girls. They were awesome. There was a bomb threat at that very first one. And I'll never forget like these two big guys were, it was at a church, um, that, that, you know, supports that. And there were posters everywhere, like educating them and teaching them like it's okay. And God still loves you and you can still get kids. I mean, it, I was raised like you, um, you treat everyone the same. You love everyone. My uncle was in the wedding industry and, um, grew up, um, well, we grew up Catholic, so I didn't know a whole lot about Jewish, which I do have a question for you in a minute about that. But, um, it was just, we were just raised, like you treat everyone the same and you love everyone the same. And so I'm so glad I was raised that way. 
um, you know, to not judge people. And I'll never forget when I sent Monica was her name down the aisle and these two gentlemen, I was just making conversation. I'm like, so do you guys work every wedding that's here? And they're like in black and they're huge muscles. And he's like, oh, they didn't tell you. And I'm like, they didn't tell me what? And he's like, oh, honey, your this church is surrounded by the bomb squad because there was a bomb threat last night. And they had suspicions that it was one of um, the the girl's moms that did it because one set oh of my the parents, gosh. yeah, it was very supportive. And then the other set of parents, they were not supportive at all. And the uh. thing was they had been best friends since kindergarten. So we like did this whole picture, big picture thing, you know, the collages back then. Um, these, this was pre-slideshow people. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and like projectors and stuff. That's how long ago it was. And, um, but I'm like, I would, I would never not show up and like, I loved them. And like, then they had kids and we were involved in baby showers and it's just, it made me so sad that the very first time they reached out and they're like, so do you do same sex weddings? And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, you're a paying client. Like I don't, I'll plan a wedding for dogs. Like I don't care who you are. (laughs) Like if you are in love and you're happy, I want to support that and show your guest and celebrate that. And they were telling me, they're like, well, we've called a bunch of people and they won't do that. But that opportunity led me to getting so many more opportunities like destination weddings to where we would go to Boston and California And then when it became legal, my mom's like, so how is this going to change your business? I'm like, well, I probably won't be traveling as much (laughs) because, (laughs) you know, it's legal, Um, but you know, which was a good thing, but it just makes me so sad. And so I guess like my question is like for planners who want to get into the Jewish market, same sex or not same sex. Um, I know I was a planner for a good 10 years before I ever got the opportunity to, and the very first opportunity I got was actually a bar mitzvah. It was not a Jewish wedding. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the doctors that I worked for in healthcare. He was my boss and I resigned from healthcare And after I resigned, he's like, are you serious? I'm like, well, yes. Like I'm going to jump. I had this opportunity to do this large wedding and I have to go on the road for it. I can't talk about it. Um, And I start crying, but he was Jewish. And, um, so he's like, so have you ever done like a Jewish wedding or a bar bat mitzvah? And I'm like, no, I haven't, but I'm, I love them and I would love to learn And he's like, good, because my son is having a bar mitzvah and we would love to hire you. And he said, now that you don't work for me anymore, because it was conflict of interest. So he actually, he knew my work ethic and he gave me a chance and they taught me a lot about, and it was almost like they were excited to like educate me about what all this stuff meant about a child turning 13. And then I started to do weddings and Um, which I did have to read and do education. And Mm -hmm. I also will say that I flat out just asked and Mm -hmm. you can't assume that people want kosher food. Like, I didn't know what that meant. Right. So, you know, I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And every Jewish wedding and bar and bat mitzvah we've done is unique and different Mm -hmm. based on like, you know, the couple and So my question for you is like, if someone who's listening, who's never done anything in the Jewish community, what's the first step to like getting in, would you say? Because it's a tight community. (laughs) It is a tight community. And so I would, so a couple different things. So I love that you said every single one is different. So even for someone who's been doing them for a long, long time, you have to treat everyone. You still have to ask all those same questions and never make those assumptions. That's the best advice. You guys all heard it directly from Angela. So <laughs> she, she gave you the best advice. Um, but to get into it, I think really you've got to find because it's really, you can do some advertising. You can submit content to the modern Jewish wedding. You can, you know, but the best way really is going to be to find a Jewish family and who they, who are they using who and go to that planner and be like, I really want you to educate me on this market. 
um, or I really want to learn, can I help you? Um, or another way that I say is a great way to get, to get your foot in the door at least is we Jewish communities, and I really still haven't figured out, figured this out because I also do a lot of nonprofit stuff. And, and so I don't quite know the answer to this, but Jewish communities throughout the country, I don't care where you live, they have fundraisers. We have fundraisers for everything. Yeah. Here in Austin, yeah. we have the Jewish Community Center. We have a day school. We have three congregations. We have a federation. We have the Jewish National Fund. I mean, like, I can tell you that there are some times when my friends laugh at me and they're like, didn't you just go to a gala last weekend? And I'm like, yeah, I have another one. So, <laughs> Multiple volunteer, times a year. Volunteer to help plan one of those fundraisers. You will meet all the people who are quote unquote sharing it or on the board of directors of the quote foundation or any of those things. You'll meet the, the high profile people in the community who can help point you in the right direction and who can help educate you and who will then become your best word of mouth person because A, you've helped them with a pain point and that is they don't, they're volunteers. They don't know how to put together a gala. You will have helped bring in probably some people, some of your vendors who um, can help with, you know, decor and things. And so you will have knocked it out of the park. You will have really um, helped, helped them. You will get some advertising and some public relations and some, you know, social media shout outs because of it. But more importantly, you will have networked your way into the Jewish community. So yeah, and that's great advice. advice. <laughs> put yourself out there. If you want mm -hmm. to do it, you got to put yourself out there. Yeah. And sometimes and you got to work hard at it. I mean, it's yes. not like you can, you can put yourself out there and then like, not really give your 100% sweat equity because you're quote volunteering. You have to look at it as a public relations marketing and those dollars that you would have charged shouldn't be, you know, those are donation dollars, but this is what you would spend in advertising in a circular. That's how you have to look at it. So. Yeah, that's great. I mean, great advice because things don't always um, fall in your lap. So you got to go out there and ask for it. Mm -hmm. um, so for the modern Jewish wedding, like what are some of the biggest successes like that you guys have had from being a media company? So um, my three goals when I first started were um, I knew that if I ever spoke at an engage or got quoted in the New York Times, that those were things that, that I could mark off as goals. The other personal goal was I really wanted to meet Abby of Stalmy Pretty. Um, and, and of course, Amy Atlas, who I, you know, had this love affair with from afar. And so <laughs> when all of those things happened, when I was able to like kind of check those off, it took me five years before I was asked to speak and engage. Yeah. Um, and then it took me, I guess, another two years after that when I got quoted in the New York Times. Um, and that was, as I said, Pinterest is still my number one driver of traffic. That was because of a Pinterest board. Um, the person was writing an article on HIPAAs in New York um, and her Pinterest board. She did a search in Pinterest that led her to me. That's um, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So those two things. And then I, <laughs> I was so shy and insecure, even after being a speaker and engaged that I think it was, it was my seventh or my 10th engage. It was actually right before Abby um, left working at Style Me Pretty. I know she's back now, but yeah. um, I went, I finally went up to her at a, at a, a, a break in the conference. And I said, you know, my very first engage, I came to meet you and I was so shy that I never introduced myself. I go, so now, you know, 10, 10 conferences later, I'm sticking my hand out there and I'm saying, hi, I'm Michelle. And she Aww. was as nice as she could be and was like, why did you wait so long? And she spent so much time with me 
and gave me so much advice about how I may have been spending so much time on my blog trying to be just like her, that my voice was maybe getting lost. And, and she just really helped change my view of what the modern Jewish wedding could be. So I really count that as a huge success. That's awesome. But again, it all goes back to networking and putting yourself out there and doing things that are uncomfortable. (laughs) Um, It is so hard, but it really is. That's, I mean, for me, that's also been the most fun is being the networking and getting myself out there and, and branching out in ways that, that I may not have ever thought I could becoming a speaker and a business consultant and all of those things that I hadn't done before are actually some of the most fun things that I get to do. So no limits, no boundaries. Right. (laughs) Well, it's like, I mean, we all have, you know, like highs and lows in this industry. And I don't think that people talk about it enough. I feel like people are becoming more comfortable talking about struggles and it's and challenges and you know while weddings are supposed to be beautiful and pretty and fun the background and what it takes to build all of this I feel like people are finally starting to like let the real world know that like hey some of this Pinterest stuff is fake (laughs) it's it's a photo shoot right it's not (laughs) I love Pinterest it has it's definitely like changed our life and and made things so much more kind of just easy to peg our clients and what they want. And it's great inspiration, but at the same time, it's almost miseducation from people thinking that, oh, the, I want that and I want to pay a hundred dollars. I'm like, like oh, yeah. well, let's go back to the education phase. Right. <laughs> um, so like when people, they're like, what are your struggles? I'm like, well, Pinterest is one of the struggle because I constantly have these people that come to me and with with all of these you know really big dreams and then when i educate them i'm just the messenger because i know what things cost and then you know they're all down and i'm like but let's find a way i'm like what exactly you know digging in like what exactly do you love about this like let's tear it apart and let's build something that can be yours that's within budget and what's comfortable for you that can still represent you as a couple um right, right. but i mean just what I know you said Pinterest is one of your number one refers. And for those of you who are listening, the way that she knows that is probably because of your analytics, right? Right. Like, exactly. Google analytics. Um, ours go ours go back and forth between Instagram and Pinterest, depending on if we're boosting something or if we've got something going on that we're trying to specifically drive traffic to. But I will say having a Pinterest board that's organized with the keywords is super important, like you were saying earlier. Um, But again, it's like all the pretties out there, but what are some of the struggles and challenges that you can share with us, just like from a business perspective as a business owner? So you, you hit on one of them there in terms of staying on top of the analytics, but really staying on top of the changing landscape of, of, of marketing um, and where your marketing dollars need to go. Um, I mean, I, none of that existed. I mean, when I started, we had Facebook um, and Facebook didn't make its money off of advertising the way it does now. I mean, now we're in silos, so it's really hard. Um, we had email marketing back then too, which is still a huge driver, but how do you get the attention? How do you get that through? So I've just spent a lot of time studying to stay current on that. Um, so that's a huge struggle. Yeah. Um, and especially for someone like me who is, I mean, my child is a millennial. I, I am not. So it's to be older. And I mean, not that I consider myself, you know, ancient, but I do have to put on my glasses to read on my phone, which literally does make Instagram a challenge for someone like me. Sure. Um, So finding, I mean, that sounds minor, but but, I mean, you don't want to have a typo. And so you have to take the time to put on the reading glasses and to pull up Instagram and it really has proven to be a time suck for me. 
Um, so I prefer things that I can do from my beautiful big screen computer. Yes. <laughs> but um, I would say, I mean, those are minor challenges compared to the challenge of being a solopreneur. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, if I want to take time off or if I'm sick or if I'm dealing with um, aging parents, or as I said, I have a child who's a millennial who's going off to school and is dealing with issues, you know, it, it is hard to juggle all of those balls. And I know that I grew up in the, you know, a woman can have it all and you can be and you can do and you can bring home the bacon and then fry it up in the pan. And that's, you know, I grew up in that environment and not one day of me has ever thought that I don't want to be a working successful career mother, but it's not easy. And I, I want the days of when we all, you know, express only a hundred percent of the best to be over. I think that we need to be transparent in our world and it is okay to admit finally that that's hard. It's yeah. hard. And if you're doing great at business, then you're probably sucking at that day of something else. Like that's just the, you know, and if I am putting 110% of myself into being present on a vacation with my family, then guess what? I'm not on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, because I can't do both. I just can't. You got to be present at some point. Yeah. And I mean, social media is great, but it it definitely with me is a love hate relationship. Oh, for sure. (laughs) Absolutely. As is email the same way. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like with over communication, Um, you know, it's almost like it is becoming more acceptable, like you just said, for just communication, like to tell people like, hey, I'm going to be on vacation with my family. I'm going to be away. Um, you know, I've had this happen to me multiple times where I, I mean, it happened to me a few weeks ago. I was doing a Facebook live at a conference in Napa and, I had a wedding at a rehearsal the next day and a wedding the next day, like 48 hours later. But again, that's why I have an awesome team and it's not about me, but the caterer got on my Facebook live and she was like, are you going to be back tomorrow? Are you? And I'm like, you're a vendor. And then, then that prompts the bride to jump on. And then, Mm -hmm. and I'm like, so verbally, I'm like, yes, this is my last day at the conference and I'll be jumping on, on a plane first thing in the morning, you know? And it's like, why do people think (laughs) it's just like socially acceptable to think that just because your weddings that weekend that the people that are putting it on for you aren't doing other things. Like yeah. I, I have to think, I mean, it's they, crazy. I, yeah, it's Brock, crazy. I definitely think they're the only people in the world. The universe <laughs> absolutely revolves around, around a bride and who is getting married that day and maybe her mom, but that's yeah. <laughs> but I'm just like, okay, what makes it socially acceptable for people to act like that? And so now, like when I take on new clients, because I'm going more like the education route and we're only going to take so many weddings that we're going to do, like I have to make sure that it's a good fit so that they're not like crazy where they're like, you, where are you? And I'm like, your wedding is not about the planner. Like it is about the vendor team. And if the planning's done right, I should be able to not be there and you not even skip a beat. Like it shouldn't really matter. So that's just something that I struggle with in social media and taking on the right client and educating them on, hey, it's, we, we do other things. Like we help the community and we educate and we do all of these things. Like mm-hmm. as, as a woman, like you can do a lot and help a lot and put out a lot, but sometimes mm-hmm. it can get really frustrating. <laughs> and this um, is why you're a business lonely. consultant because you you have such good advice. You just made, you just made said, you said, you know, I have to make sure it's the right fit. And that goes back, I think to me as a blogger in that we can help you make sure that you're reaching or you, the Royal you, we can make sure that vendors, all of them or creative partners, as we now like to call them all, um, are me are getting 
the attention of the audience that you want. Yes. Um, there are blogs out there. There are wedding blogs for everyone. There is rock and roll bride. There is the DIY bride. There is the budget bride. There is the, you know, destination wedding bride. There's Indian bride. There's um, the oversized or not typical looking curvy bride. I don't know what the right word is to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I would be one. So that was not meant to be derogatory. No, um, no. <laughs> and we, and you wouldn't necessarily submit content to those blogs who are not going to help you find couples that are going to be a good fit for you. Um, and so that's another thing that I think um, people who are just starting out in this business, they want to be all things to everybody. And so um, they put things out and, and you don't realize until, but oh my gosh, that gut instinct of like, you know what? I really shouldn't be taking this event on. I can tell right now, this is not going to be a good match. And it's so hard when you're first starting out to say, let me refer you to someone who's going to be a better fit. Cause you see those dollar signs and you're like, I, I need all the business I can take, but in the long run, trust us. Those of us who have been doing this for more than 10 years, pass on that client to someone who will be better served. Yeah. You will both be happier, the client and you. It's so true. And one of my favorite thing, things to say is like, know what you do and do what you know and like stick to it. And like, I mean, we get asked from different um, media outlets where there was a show, a local show in Nashville and they're like, Hey, can you come on and talk about DIY and what that means? And my brand manager was like, absolutely not, because we don't do that. We don't sell that. We don't monetize off of that. We don't educate on that because we're, we're literally full service. And what I have learned the hard way is when girls or guys or whoever, they want to do a DIY project, 98% of the time it ends up, what that really means translation is fall on Angela's shoulders and then <laughs> we're going to, and then my team will execute it, but they're going to have to pay for that time. And mm -hmm. so there's just been, it's like, I really do love it when people get excited and they're like, yeah, we're going to make our own this and we're going to put our own welcome bags together and we're going to do this. And I'm like, okay, but the, 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 I mean, your time's going to run out and I can just tell you and all the other weddings that it just, it doesn't happen. So depending on what it is, like if there's not a legal issue and what I mean by that is like people saying, Oh, my grandma is going to do the flowers and my aunt's going to make the food. And like, you can't have grandma and grandma's friends climbing up on ladders in a public museum, like legally, like that's just not okay. Like you have to have a business license. You have to have insurance. You got to have a real business. And, sh and it just makes it more stressful on everyone when each person doesn't know what they're doing and it ends up falling all on the planner. And so taking all those weddings early on where I had no clue what the hell I was doing and I said yes to all the wrong things, but it did help me learn a lot. And it has given me a lot of tools now to know when it's not a good fit. Um, so knowing it's okay to say no, and it's okay to say that's not in alignment with my brand. You know, I hear sometimes people say any PR is good PR. And I'm like, well, I don't really believe that because oh, I don't, yeah. if I don't want to do Jewish weddings, then I don't want PR on a Jewish blog. <laughs> like, right. Like, duh. Um, so you really have to think through the strategy of it. Um, and I feel like so many people they think that all of us in the wedding industry, everything is happy and everything's perfect. And, you know, we're all perfect human beings. But the bottom line is like, like you just said, we have families, we have kids. Some of us, we I have two dogs, you know, I have a mom, I had a dad with cancer, you know, I have a sister with ALS, she's got four kids. It's just like, not that I want to talk about that all the time, but I think people that are getting married become so consumed they, that they forget that their planner and their vendors, like we're people too. And we, we have feelings and we make mistakes and it's okay to 
not be okay all the time. You don't have to live in pretty land all the time. So I know one thing that we had talked about is just like, how do you handle the balance of happiness versus, you know, like you said, being a solopreneur. I mean, some people can say it's very depressing at the top and like, how do you handle that? Oh God. Um, loaded question. (laughs) Yeah. Well, um, so the first thing I will say is, and you know, it still to this day takes me courage to say this out loud. Um, but I, I have medication. I'm yeah. And that's okay. And I, I go to therapy regularly. Um, and I use the calm app every morning. So Love it. I listen, you know, I try and start my day at least centered before, you know, it gets wacky with email, just as we said, email, social media and children calling and texting, um, or parents, as, as mm-hmm. you said, same thing. So that's still really hard for me to say out loud because, you know, it's still, I think we're, it's becoming more socially acceptable to say, you know, I have anxiety and depression, but I think what that really is that hasn't necessarily sunk in beyond like, oh, she has trouble dealing with, with something and she's just sad right now. And the truth is that I have a, I have a chemical imbalance in my brain. And that means that I take medication every day of my life. I've been taking it since I was in my early twenties and I'm about to be 50 and I'm going to be taking it for the rest of my life. Yeah. I'm lucky in that my life hasn't ended at some of those times when I've been that depressed. Yeah. Um, And the reason is, is because I have an amazing support community. Um, And so I do all the things that I can to take care of myself, but ultimately it's because I have opened up and I have become less afraid to say my truth that my, I have had more support than I did before. Um, because, because of, of, of me being transparent and real with people, um, I've been able to develop people that I can be real with and who, who care enough about me um, that, for example, um, the week that both Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain both both committed suicide. Yeah. It was a really, really hard week for me. Kate Spade was my spirit animal, and Aww. I was just really struggling. And I had people who knew me well enough to know to reach out and be like, we don't want you to be alone right now. Mm-hmm. Like, w- what can we do? And so I think that's, that's really it. I mean, I, I have to do everything in my power to take care of myself, but sometimes you have to rely on other people to help you. And I, and the same thing as a business owner, we, you know, just as we were talking, we have all these other things and, and we have had to have great teams, whether that's regular people that we have on our staffs or whether we're, we're like me, a small enough business that I don't have a staff, but I have contractors or I have creative partners that I know that if I let them know, Hey, I, I need you to bring your A plus game today because I may only, you know, I'm I'm not a hundred percent there yet. They're gonna pick me up and they're gonna help me get to where I need to be. And it's okay. Like, and I think that that's what I, I do agree. It's becoming, thank God, more socially acceptable for people to say, like, listen, if you don't struggle from, or if you've never experienced like true depression, it's really hard to have a conversation with someone who's never experienced it. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I worked in healthcare and so that was one of the first jobs that I worked in and was part of a therapy group of normal people that ever, I mean, you would never know it. They, um, men and women that would come in dressed very nice. They drove nice cars. They had perfect hair. Their husbands and wives were beautiful. Their kids were perfect. You know, everything looked perfect. And then you get into the therapy room and you, you start conducting, I was the intern back then, but it's like the, the psychologists that I practice under, you know, would start conducting everything for the therapy. And I, I mean, I was just like, 
holy shit. Like you would never look at this person and think that like, a, there's something wrong. And like, they're literally, I'm like, what do you have? How, how are you sad? Like you have a great job. You have a great husband. You have great kids. Like what's your problem? <laughs> but mm-hmm. it's like that, that was me as a young college kid going in, but then coming out of that internship, oh my God, it changed everything about how I saw people and how I respected people and how like when people honk at me and flick me off, like if I cut them off on accident, like I wave and smile. Like I don't like do the middle finger back because you never know what's going on with someone when you look at them Absolutely. and you could be that last person that gives somebody like a friendly smile when they're so stressed out because they're dealing with a medical issue. And some people don't take their medicine and they don't ask for help. And those are the people that end up, you know, doing those things that we hope, you know, people never do, but knowing that there is a support group and there's other people in the the wedding profession that deal with all kinds of things. And now I feel like, you know, it's, it's okay to, to talk about it, but knowing that, a lot of the wedding pros that I know that struggle and deal with depression and schizophrenic and bipolar and, yeah. and even if it's not them, they have a family member or their child or their significant other, or they live in the same household with those people. And it's like, how do you deal with that? And the best ways is, that I've seen work is just like literally having that support group of trust where you can talk about it and like there's a group, I don't, I don't even know what, what it's called, but it's, um, it's like similar to AA where, where like, that's, that's supposed to be a good thing. Like mm-hmm. you're there to get help. And, and I mean, you're still, even though you might suffer from something, you still are a badass business owner and a hard worker, <laughs> but people still need to understand that like we're people too. Um, and, and that's okay. So I can't even tell you how many lives that were saved, like just in my presence of being an intern and so many people coming through that, it was called a practicum, uh, therapy group where instead of nine to five, they would go to work, they would come to therapy and it was like a six week and an eight week and a 12 week. And the people at the end of it saying, you know, hugging us all and saying like, you saved my life. Um, and like one of my favorite speakers, he, um, owns a Veda, which, you know, is like a hair product and Mm -hmm. a makeup line. And I didn't know who he was. Like I got an email from this group that I'm in and they said they were having this speaker. I didn't know who he was. I didn't Google his name. It said, come here, the day maker. And I'm like, oh, this guy's going to tell me how to get all my work done during the day. Like that's literally <laughs> literally what I thought because I would work, you know, and I still do it. I'm, I'm a night owl. And so, um, so I go and it's not what I thought. And he tells us about his journey, um, about how he has owned salons and how he started as a valet, uh, parking cars and just kind of his story. And when people say, well, what do you do? He says, I'm a day maker. And so, I mean, he makes a very good living off of having multiple salons all around the world. And his mentor actually started Aveda. Um, But he said that he has saved multiple people's lives. And one lady, she would come in, you know, those older ladies that go to their beautician like every other Friday to like get their hair done. (laughs) Like that's my grandma. So. (laughs) Yeah. Like this lady came in. He's like, my favorite story about one of my clients is that she came in on an off day and he's like, today's not Friday. And like, why is she coming in? And he's like, it was just for a blowout in a style, but he's like, I'm a hundred percent present with any of my clients while I'm, if they want to talk, if they want to work, whatever they want, I am absorbed in them. And so he was asking her like, why are you here today? Like, do you have a special social event tonight? And she's like, no, David, you just make me feel beautiful. And I just had a really hard day and I'm just not feeling well. And so I just wanted to feel beautiful. And every time you do my hair, it makes me feel better about myself. And he's like, you know, it's going to get better. Like the day's over, you know, just pumping her up, like being positive. 
And she went home and she was going to commit suicide that night. And she wanted to look beautiful in her casket. And that's what this letter said that her sister found. And she called her sister and said, I need you to take me and check me into treatment because I'm suicidal. And so the sister took that note to him. And it's like, I looked like there were not many women in this, this room when he was like telling the story. And like, there were hardly any dry eyes. I was going to say I'm crying. Right yeah. Now. Like any dry eyes. And so he's like, you know, you never know like the really simple things and how you can smile at someone and make their day. Like I still get chills and he just like, I'm not a big crier, but at the time, like he almost died of bone cancer. And he said that the reason that he is still alive today is because he wouldn't take no for an answer. He lived in Hawaii and he was like, I, I'm not ready to die. Like I am here to make a difference in the world and the beauty industry and make everyone feel beautiful from the inside out that you don't have to be a 90 pound model to be beautiful. And so he got all these people that he had touched, like the best of the best to help him get treatment. And he went through this great treatment. He fought the cancer. He's alive. Um, and he documented his whole story and showed us all the pictures. And I mean, there were probably 250 people in this room. And so after the, I mean, it, it, he was just a great speaker. And so I went to the bathroom afterwards and I sat down in the stall and I just cried. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> Oh yeah. my God, that was, and then I Googled like how to stop crying and Oprah came <laughs> up, <laughs> like on Google. And so, but Oprah was talking about like how to deal with depression and how to help others and how to be kind and how to just because you're having a bad day, like try to smile it through because someone else is having a worse day than you. Um, and you never know what people are going through. So I know I totally went off on a tangent there, but with all that to say, um, you never know like who you can touch. And I feel like by being vulnerable and telling stories and being real that you, you can still be a badass business owner and you're still going to have your bad days. Like that's just how it is. I mean, no one's perfect. So do you have any tips for people out there that might have like struggles and they're not sure what to do. I mean, I feel like you said your support group is like a backbone, but well, I guess else? it just believe that you really truly are never alone. And if, even if you have to reach out to a stranger, I mean, there is a hotline. There are, there are people that, that love you and care for you, no matter how you're feeling that are going to love you even when you're sad and depressed. And trust me, I know that when you're in the middle of it, you don't believe that to be the case, but, but it can, it can take 30 seconds for, for a snap decision to, to be true, you know, to come to, to, to have a, a suicidal feeling. And if you can just get through that 30 seconds on the other side of it, don't, don't make that, that one choice that, that will take every other choice away from you. And I, I speak from experience about knowing that. So, but I, I also think that, you know, that you can have an invisible support group just as much just like I said, Calm um, is an app that I use. Um, but there's great podcasts out there. There's new things where you can reach, have online on-call therapy through apps. There's, um, but just don't be afraid and don't be embarrassed because I promise you, you are not the only one who has struggles. Yeah. It's everybody deals with things. I mean, one of the number one things I feel like a lot of people re will reach out to me just from like being a psychology geek. They're like, they'll forward me emails and say, I don't even know how to respond to this. And like, they're so defensive and they're so upset. And I'm like, well, first off, like, why would you respond to this? You know, it's a negative email. Like, why would you not take five minutes, pick up the phone or text the client and say, let's talk about this. Do you let me know when you have five minutes? Because so much gets lost in translation through email and text message where oh, people yes. yeah, get defensive. And like, I feel like some of the people that I have worked with in the past that like struggle with like depression and some of these other 
things, there's triggers and there's certain things that will trigger them into this past hole that they just want to crawl up in bed and not come out for days. And they want to avoid it instead of facing it. And, and I would just say like you to, to, to really face it and ask for help, ask how to deal with it. I promise you somebody out there, like you said earlier, they've dealt with it and it's yeah. okay to ask for help. Like we don't know everything. And I mean, there's, there's times when I'm helping my sister with her kids and she's like, I don't know what to do with this. I'm like, I don't know what to do either. I have zero experience in sharing. However, there's a business group that I'm in. They all have kids. Let me ask them what they would do. Like, let me ask people who actually have experience in doing it. And then, then I can come back to you and, and offer some guidance, but you know, don't pretend like you were saying earlier to be everything to everybody. Like it's okay that you don't know everything. So yeah, you have, you have, proven in interviewing me why your business is so successful at consulting because you really you're you speak from the heart and with experience and so um as I said one of the things that one of the reasons I like to do this and connect with others is because even though um I'm the quote interviewee I get to learn from from your experience so yeah, it, it will. And it's awesome. Like, I absolutely love that you've like taken your heritage and your culture and like just all the stuff that you've learned and like roll it into this awesome blog and like helping people. But, you know, it's fun. And, and also, like you said, the good, the bad, the ugly, like you're able to address it and talk about it as a business owner. And like, that's okay, which I love about you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Been, this is great. Thank you Yay. so much. Well, tell our listeners, like, where can they find out more about you? And if they want to submit um, a Jewish wedding, like, what should they do? So the blog is themodernjewishwedding.com. Um, and I also have Michelle Schwartz, and that's Michelle with one L, my name, Michelle Schwartz.me. Um, which is kind of a, a resume or if you, if you want, you know, you want to find out a little more about me behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, but uh, to submit, you can email submission at the modern Jewish wedding.com or Michelle with one L at modern Jewish wedding.com. And you'll come directly to me. And then I highly recommend two bright lights. So that's really the best way to find us is on to submit is to write lives. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing all kinds of awesome stuff with us today. I really Thank you for having it. me. You're welcome. This has been an honor. So really it's it's been a lot of fun to spend to spend the last the the last few moments and time with you. I feel I feel like I learned from you too. So thank you. Awesome. You are so welcome. Thank you for all of your wisdom and your tips. And guys, be sure to check Michelle out. And if you have any Jewish weddings that you want to submit, be sure to submit them over. And thank you so much for joining us on Weddings Unveiled. Be sure to tune in next week to learn more. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with your friends, and I am so very grateful if you will leave a review. Be sure you are a subscriber so you never, ever miss the juicy details of Weddings Unveiled. Also, be sure that you're a part of my email list, and if not, you can sign up at AngelaProfit.com where I share valuable resources and exclusive products with only my subscribers. Before I go, I want to ask you, if you have a story or a product to share with the wedding and event industry, please let me know. To be considered as a guest on Weddings Unveiled, visit AngelaProfit.com and submit a podcast guest form. Until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.